Hey fellow mobs, Moby here. I stream every Thursdays and Saturdays at 3 p.m. PST. Now back to the video. Welcome back to Armored Legends. In this series, we interview some of the best players in the world and have them share their strategies, builds, and tech. This player has created and mastered the next evolution of the BVO style, known as FBO. I go by JC or Tech on the Internet. I'm 22 years old and I come from Lebanon. It's this teeny tiny country in the Middle East. I am a computer science student and I'm currently doing my bachelor's degree. In my spare time, I like to draw and paint. I do game dev stuff like 3D modeling and Unity. I also like going biking around the country and I bake pastries a lot for myself and my neighbors. Uh, I play a lot of racing games, uh, mostly arcadey ones. So like Forza, Need for Speed, Wipeout, and Ballistic NG. Um, I also like air combat games like Project Wingman and Ace Combat. Combat. So why do I play lightweight and what was my take on PVO? I love high mobility in pretty much any video game. It's no different in AC6. So over the course of playing this game, I've tried all sorts of other heavier builds like Zim Shield, Water Strider, heavy bipeds, tanks, slam rats, and no doubt I had some success on those, but it just it just didn't feel right, you know? Like I kept going back to lightweight, and that's the thing. I will keep enjoying playing lightweight no matter how bad the circumstances are. You can nerf all my weapons, all my options, but uh, as long as I can go fast and jump high, everything will be okay. That's why I found BBO so enticing. It gave me tons of mobility options, like AB, QBs, going up and down is just much faster, but it also bestowed me the power to slay giants. It genuinely felt like speed mattered, even if sometimes the game's netcode or lag can kind of fail you in a dodge or die situation. And that's why I used Hammer and Aperitif, because those were definitely geared towards setting up an all-out attack against tanks, tetras, and heavy bipeds, and still coming out on top. So yeah, it was very fun and rewarding to dodge everything, and than being able to deal so much damage. When patch 1.05 dropped, it was kind of a dark day for a lot of melee players, not just BBO. LCB and Lammergeier legs were added to the game and they were broken as hell. You couldn't get near anyone without getting instantly vaporized and it got worse with higher latency. So landing melees against good players was also already hard enough. That patch also introduced the tank bug, which made it basically impossible to land your full melee combo on certain tanks that got staggered. So that's why I had to drop Scorpio for that patch specifically. What did I use instead and what did the the build I'm currently running look like pre-patch. I've been actually exploring the idea of a Fasan lightweight since like patch 1.03. This was before Lammergeier parts existed, so I had this build codenamed yesterday and it was using the Knotfrider core instead. It was sort of a catch-22. You couldn't meet EN requirements without being overweight and vice versa, so it had serious compromises like the Abbott FCS and the PO4 booster, and it was still overburdened by 90 weight. And being overburdened by 90 weight doesn't impact boost speed that much, but it still meant that I had to avoid hitting the ground too hard because I would get mini stunned and I would probably die then. So I call my build the Plasma Sniper, or FBO, short for Fasan Viento Ocellus. Build part choice, what does the build look like now? Well, why did I use Fasans for starters? Two charged Fasans deal a ton of damage when used as a stagger. What separates them from something like LCB or Earshots is their huge projectile velocity and no damage fall off. This makes you able to punish staggers from any distance away and that just makes it really safe and reliable. Why do I still use Vientos over other pistols? Most pistols have way too many problems that keep them from being dependable means of building up impact, so they either lack projectile velocity, effective range, fire rate, or have insane recoil. The Entos were the best of the bunch because they had a nice combination of all of these, even if something like Coquillets or Ducats had better impact per second on paper. The Entos still allows you to spend as little time as possible in the danger zone of another CQC build because their fire rate was so high, so you can employ hit and run tactics until their impact bar is high enough for committing to a punish. At Sujins, they can't fit on Heatsink, they're much too heavy, and Heatsink is already bored aligned overburden. Its Sujins are kind of more suited for Kaidi playstyles. The core choice. This build definitely wouldn't be possible without the Lammergeier core. Uh, it was kind of like a blessing for lightweights because they could finally support power hungry weapons that heavies were running for so long and it kind of finally gives them a fair shot in terms of firepower. The high supply adjustment also plays nicely with the energy firearm spec generators. Those usually have very slow recharge and red lines but the booster efficiency adjustment is pretty low on Lammergeier core so that means you have significantly higher QB costs than on the other lightweight cores. Choosing the head was a bit difficult, but I ended up choosing the Cosware head because I already have plenty of EN to spare, and also so I can meet weight requirements. I can support the very stat-dense VB44D head if I wanted, but I don't really see the point, because like my AP and defenses are already paper-thin, so I'd rather have a head with better utility than defenses, and Cosware 
has all of those arms and FCS choice. For quite some time, it's been up for debate about how exactly recoil control and firearm specialization factored into your build's performance. With what we know now, I can confidently say that firearm spec is not too significant for most builds. What matters most is your FCS and playing within your FCS's range. Firearm spec mostly improves your lock-on times by around 0.5 seconds at ranges where your FCS is already bad, but only by a few tenths of a second at ranges where your FCS is already really good. So not big of a difference. This is why I chose Lammergeier arms, because they have very good recoil control and manage Gantos very well. It's basically a short range impact laser. Leg choice. Why am I still using knock legs over all button for missing? I still use those legs because they are by far the best lightweight legs. Like you want all the mobility you can get on a build like this. So for missile legs and all the legs have higher load limits, but their jump stats are just atrocious and they only act as a consolation prize if you can't fit your build on knock legs. Jump height is super important with this build because it helps quickly get a better view of the ground and kind of gauge where I should shoot facades to catch opponents in the explosion. In this game, it's really hard to perceive depth if you're on the same level as your opponent, so being above them and seeing the ground is just easier. Every leg has a jump distance set and that improves how far your QB goes on the ground. And Nox is like way higher than the other lightweight legs. It's like by a huge margin and it's definitely noticeable. It makes boosters with low QB thrusts still be decent on the ground. For this build, you can only really run two generators, and they each have their perks and downsides. You can choose the NGI generator, which has a whopping 4.4k capacity, and thanks to the Lammer Core, it has a redline delay of around 2.9 seconds, but you get 3.3k EN back instantly after that. This lets you do some gnarly stuff in the air, like you never have to touch the ground, and it lets you relentlessly chase kites, and you still get decent energy spec. Energy spec of the NGI generator, it improves Fasan's damage by 5%, and it's charge speed by 10%. For each point above 100, that's 1% charge speed, and every two points is plus 1% damage. The NGI generator has some downsides, like in CQC matchups, you have to be very careful about when you redline. You have to choose a very safe opportunity to redline, otherwise you're gonna get boned. The other alternative is VE20C. This is a beefy energy generator. Like, it will improve Fasan's damage by 14%, and its charge speed by 28%, and this is very noticeable, especially against tanky opponents. The lower capacity and 1.6 second recharge delay is a bit uncomfortable though, it's also heavier. You can't fit boosters past a certain weight threshold. Both generators are viable, depending on your playstyle. Personally, I find the VE20C is better though. I like that raw damage output. After having tried out a lot of boosters, I've come to the conclusion that you should just run whatever booster you're most comfortable with. I used to run Alula on it most of the time, but I also find the SPD, P04, Flugel, NGI, and P10. They're all viable boosters depending on your playstyle. If you are using the VE20C generator though, that does limit you to just SPD or P10. And I would choose SPD in that case because even if it doesn't have great QB stats, it still has excellent neutral thrust, decent vertical thrust, and good enough AB with strafes that can dodge missiles. If you want to pick up this build, both the booster and generator choices are ultimately up to you. Just ask yourself one question, do you want to prioritize mobility or do you want to prioritize raw damage output? It's up to you, honestly. General strategy, people say that I play the build primarily as a sniper or a glass cannon above all else. And yeah, I think that's mostly accurate. My AP is some of the lowest in PVP. It's just under 8,000. Because of Fasans, it has the longest combat effective range in AC6. Charged Fasans can go up to 750 meters away, well beyond what missiles can lock on to. It also has the highest projectile speed in the game and it explodes in a 60 meter radius. This makes them very good for manual aiming and poking opponents from the other side of the map. But it's not just limited to that. What I like about the build is that I'm using all three different firing modes at different ranges. At close range, I'm using hard lock. At mid range, I switch to soft lock. And at long range, I'll just manually. The first five seconds of the match are so important. You need to get a few hits off and then it's like AP lead secure. Some friends of mine, they show me replays of our matches from their side and it's it's genuinely terrifying seeing facades hurtle towards you from a mile away. It's like an orbital cannon. Playing this build effectively starts as early as the match intro screen. Are you fighting a lightweight or a heavyweight? Because if you're against a heavy like a Born Missa tank, they're in the ballpark of 16,000 AP and 1,300 in defenses. That's over 20,000 effective AP. You basically have to deal three times more damage to them than they do to you in order to win. So you're already at a disadvantage no matter what. And for that reason alone, your best hope is to play the match for AP lead and run down the timer. And yeah, that does involve keeping your distance and running away if you feel threatened. 
I know less experienced players are gonna complain that, oh, it's so boring, or oh, it's a cheap exploit, or whatever. I say, what the hell are you talking about? This is the smartest thing you could be doing as a lightweight. Your positioning on the map and minimizing your chances of getting hit are such valuable assets in many games, including this one. And besides, no one wants to run headfirst and miss their meals on wheels over here and immediately die. That's not really fun either, is it? As for fighting lightweights and midweights, since the time to kill difference is much closer between you two, you're likely gonna adopt a more aggressive playstyle and try to go for the knockout. And since both of you can kind of keep up with each other in terms of speed, running away is less effective, even if in some cases you can and should to reset your stagger. I have all sorts of tactics with facades at different ranges. So first of all, to those who don't know, manual aiming most weapons, except for missiles, will not give off a warning. So your opponent has less time to react to a manual aim shot. This includes facades, and since they are attacker sided, what you see is what you get. If you see them getting caught in facades blast on your screen, they will get hit on theirs. Whenever a round begins, the first thing I will do is quickly strike first. Get a line of sight of the opponent and manually fire facades from across the map in hopes of damaging them. And there you go, boom. AP lead secured, come and get me. To do this, and this is beautiful advice that I got from Takafumi, you can vaguely find out how far away the enemy AC is by using the number tag that appears above them. And it appears at around 800 meters. So that's your cue to fire facades and potentially get air bursts at 750 meters. And people are like wondering, how are you hitting them from so far away? And that's exactly how I'm doing it. I know that they're 800 meters away and that's when facade blows up. One thing about long range facade is you can get really good at hitting them if you lead your shots in such a way that they fly right into the plasma's damage zone. So it's kind of like bullet prediction that FCS is used, but at extremely long range. And most opponents don't expect this at all the first time this happens, so better make it count. So should the opponent slip into mid-range, I can still continue to manual aim, but it can be risky if they also have weapons like Harris's or Walt Rifle or missiles. I am on a lightweight biped, so I can't exactly fire facades whenever I want, like a tank or tetra can, because the firing animation will stance me, and standing still on a build with as low stability as this is just asking for trouble. So try and look for small windows when it's safe to stand still. And guys, please, use terrain to your advantage. The floor, the buildings, the destructible objects, all of these can be used as splash points for Fasan and getting free damage. Don't be shy, take as many pot shots as you can, Fasan can fire 13 charge shots. And I can assure you I've never run out of ammo ever on Fasan's like in a round. Just use them as much as you can. One more thing about mid ranges, you can also shoot around cover to hit people hiding behind stuff and just completely catch them off guard. That's where a good scan usage comes in handy, so you always have info on where the enemy is. But if my opponent is playing smart and avoiding the ground or buildings, I can still use soft lock in mid range to hit them midair for just a little bit of damage or keeping stagger from resetting. It is important to note that facades don't have proximity detonation like nebulas do, so it is a bit harder to hit them directly on an AC. Close range facade tactics. This is where uh, stuff gets uh, wild. <laughs> Make no mistake, this build can still put up a fight at close range, even if it isn't ideal for a lot of matchups. This is where I play the build more like a traditional BVO and use hard lock to win the stagger war, then use facades as a stagger punish. I also use them outside of stagger punish as a sort of mix-up attack or as area denial against opponents charging towards me. So like you can just fuss on the ground in front of somebody charging towards you and they will just eat the damage. Or as a last ditch effort, I can fuss on myself to deny any melee punishes. It's kind of like a pocket fuss on armor. So by far the most used core expansion is Pulse Armor. It's simply so versatile, and a lot of 1v1s hinge around who pops PA first, who still has PA. But for Fasans, PA can be greatly taken advantage of with good reaction time and prediction. To those who don't know, an interesting interaction with Fasans is that they will continue to deal their full damage even if the opponent uses Pulse Armor, as long as it hits before the shield bubble comes up on your screen. This on its own is already huge, but what's more, they still take impact during this time. You can end up staggering ACs in the middle of their PA, putting it completely to waste and letting you make a clean getaway in the process. But ideally, you want the facades to not stagger the target and instead nearly fill up the bar. So that's where shooting uncharged facades comes in handy because once PA comes down, the stagger from the uncharged facades is still gonna be there and your facades are still ready to go. So you can just stagger them with Vientos right away and deliver a more devastating punish. They're about to PA, you fire uncharged facades. They take like maybe 50-60% of their impact bar, but your facades are charging again and you take down the PA with Vientos and their stagger bar is still there and it hasn't reset so just fire Vientos again, stagger them and fire charge facades and they have nothing to defend it with.
This is where it becomes important to predict when your opponent will PA. So skilled players know all about this little interaction and they will preemptively PA so you can't react fast enough with the facades. It kind of becomes a mind game. Like, aha, I know that you know when I'm going to pop PA, but then you're like, ah, I also know that you know that I know when you're going to pop PAs. So yeah, it becomes a big mind game. Sometimes I PA if I'm in danger, then immediately fire charge facades in case they counter PA and then watch them instantly regret it. With Heatsink, the rule of thumb is, the bigger the map, the better. So stuff like Wall Sector B, Bonadeo Dunes, Watchpoint Delta, those give you lots of room to make space between you and your opponent and get those facade snipes in. Maps with lots of cover are also pretty decent too, like Dylem and Spaceport. You can take advantage of those a lot to hit opponents behind cover and also avoid missiles coming at you at the same time. Maps I definitely don't want to be on are really small and cramped ones like Jorgen, Grid 86A, and Grid 12 for obvious reasons. There's just nowhere to go, so you're relegated to just face your opponent head on in those maps. So after patch 1.06, Scientos did get nerfed, a bit too harshly in my opinion. Not because of the impact nerf, that's fine actually, but the 0.5 second increased reload time is a big hit for a lot of Heatsink CQC interactions. More so because FromSoft didn't even bother buffing any of the other pistols except for Sampu, which is still a really really bad weapon, don't let anyone tell you otherwise. I still think Gentos are the best in slot, even after the nerf. It's just kind of sad that we didn't really get any nice changes to lightweights that we were hoping for, like actually giving Alba and Fermesa like significantly better jump stats or making the other pistols viable. So notably good matchups. Heatsink was particularly good as a response to patch 1.05's ranked meta, and I think it did a pretty good job because it got me to top 100 again, and it made a lot of people rage quit, so I must be doing something right. Remember kids, as a wise man once said, quitters are worse than losers. Lamb rats are a pretty easy target for Heatsink, especially on the NGI generator, because you can just keep ABing at them nonstop. You just need to get one stagger and it's all over in one punish. I see a lot of them use kicks to climb up efficiently to max altitude at the start of the round, and that is a perfect opportunity to snipe them and get a huge AP lead in the first 10 seconds they never expected. You just gotta watch out for the ones using hammer, try and get below them, and AB directly upwards. Try to fake out the hammer before re-engaging them. So you can fake out hammer by dead falling before you get into range and they will throw it out and miss and then start ABing again. Most tanks are also pretty beatable, at least the ones that like to stay on the ground a lot. They're sluggish and they can't QB so I can just keep a safe distance away from them and occasionally shoot the ground and just chip away at their AP. LCB tank specifically does give me some difficulties because two MLT4s do a great job of preventing me from stancing facades and also the charge attack is always like a looming threat to one-shot me. DPS race builds like Larpsters are kind of a mixed bag. It can go either way, honestly. On one hand, you can usually outrun the heavier ones and win by AP lead. On the other, sometimes you just try to CQC them and hope to out DPS them with facades. Notably hard matchups. Oh boy, <laughs> what a list. <laughs> I'm kidding. Zim Shield and Quad Shotguns are a particularly difficult matchup. Not just for heatsink, but for lightweights in general. It's hard to keep your distance when all they really need to do is assault boost at you and stagger you in like two or three well-placed shots. So you also have to play exclusively on the ground and use QBs because hiding a Zim Shield or shotgun build in the air is just asking to get bum rushed. Like you have nowhere to go. It's not impossible, but you have to make virtually no mistakes and make every facade shot count. Crab Knight and Rat Knight are extremely difficult because they can be airborne for extended periods of time so there's less opportunities to land manually in facade shots, but they're also really tanky. So CQCing them is like walking on a tightrope because you have to actively avoid getting into hammer range and also avoid jab beta. Those two have insane reload times, so it's it's just non-stop dodging stuff. I'm the type of AC6 player who likes to have their cake and eat it. So, you know, I need my build to be both viable competitively and also fashionable at the same time. And uh, I'm never satisfied until it's both of those things. Uh, when I saw the new Lammergeier parts, I immediately thought that they looked like really thematic parts for an unpiloted drone AC. So I got to using great camel paint and added some extra vent decals and jet intake warnings to make the AC look like it's a new generation fighter jet. Uh, also, the arms at both facades, when they're folded back, look like wings and thrusters, and I think that's really badass. The Lammer core also stood out to me, and I really like the little exposed core bit at the middle was a different color from the rest, so I leaned right into that and gave it some high-tech decals to make it look more like an unstable prototype. That, and that also matches the part's description of being like this unsafe uh, for the pilot core. Um, not a lot of head parts fit well with the Lammer core in my opinion, but uh, the Cosmore head kind of does. It, it, it works. Even even though I'm not the biggest fan of the customer 
has asymmetry, I still think it looks okay. Um, there's also hints of a brass color sprinkled around the AC, and that reminds me of actual heat sinks made of copper and aluminum. Uh, and it's just to say that this AC is gonna get very hot once its boosters fire up and its plasma railguns let loose. Next time on Armored Legends. Two players with tournament records unlike any other. Stay tuned.